G'day, it's Rowan from Elfshot Design. Welcome to my channel and this video, which is all about building a kit shed here in Australia. I've broken the build down into 10 stages, which covers everything from design and planning through to council approvals, the costs, and of course, the build itself. Now, just like a house becomes a home, my shed is gonna become my workshop. Let's jump in. We've already got a tin garage. I'm gonna convert that into a clubhouse and build a new shed beside it. As I like to do sometimes, I've started with a 3D sketch, which helps me move things around and visualize how much space I need. You could use paper, but I've just made rectangles digitally of all my major workshop elements. Although there's two roller doors, I only intend on keeping one side accessible to get vehicles through. Any tool stations on that side will be ones I have caster wheels on. So if I ever need to get something through, I can just wheel them aside. Some other considerations I factored in included insulation for temperature extremes, practical access for the shed from the house, extra height to help fumes dissipate, good drainage to ensure this never happens, and lots of power points and really good lighting. You can see some plans forming for the clubhouse next door, but this will have to wait till next year. Looked around at various manufacturers and ended up going with Best Sheds because I knew a few people who had them and they seemed to have good prices and supporting information on their website. Based on the outcomes from my planning, I chose a 10.5 by 7 metre shed with 3 metre eave height. It also includes two electric roller door motors, a personal access door and a window. I specified to have the back left open so I could join this to my existing machinery shed. I recently built a custom box gutter to join the other two sheds. The big gutter ensures no water overflows during wild storms. So I'll do this again, join the new shed. I'll offset the new slab by 250mm to allow for that 250mm box gutter. The cost for my shed, including the roller door motors, was $10,500. But I bought a heap of extra air cell insulation to use later on the clubhouse. Without the insulation, it would have cost about $7,500 for the shed kit. That also includes the $330 delivery fee. It was a six week lead time on the order, so you've got plenty of time to start the paperwork with council. The rules are different across the states and councils, so I'll just cover the things I had to do here in rural New South Wales. If you value what's in your shed, you're gonna to wanna to make sure it's covered by your home or property insurance. So it's worthwhile getting things certified, even though it takes longer and costs more. Since my shed's over 50 metres squared, I had to submit a development application. I look at various things like distance to neighbours, bushfire zones, environmental impacts, and other considerations. There are four basic steps to compliance, and this is kind of boring, so feel free to skip ahead if you're not interested. To submit my application to council, I needed to provide the following forms. I named all my files sequentially to keep track of everything. Development application, construction certificate application, Statement of Environmental Effects, Bushfire Assessment Report, Property Sketches showing the boundary setbacks and distance to the main dwelling, Construction Quotes to validate the total declared costs, Engineering Plans as provided by the shed manufacturer, this is usually included in their kit price, and also the Structural Certificate which is also provided by the shed manufacturer. The total cost for the submission to Council was $650. Meanwhile, you have to decide if you want to build the shed or appoint a builder civil contractor. If you appoint a builder, you provide their license number to council on the notice to commence form. For me, I wanted to build it myself, so I had to apply for an owner builder permit. To become an owner builder, you have to have an active white card, technically called a general construction induction card. To get this, it's an eight hour course, either at a registered training facility or a live virtual classroom. The cost of the white card was $150 and the owner builder permit through fair trading was $179. Now you're all good to go, almost. You still have to appoint a certifier so you can line them up for the first inspection. You have to choose if you'll appoint a private certifier or just go through council. I decided to go through council. There are two more forms. It's a form for appointing the principal certifying authority, in my case I chose council, and there's also a notice to commence work form which has to be provided at least 48 hours before any earthworks commences. 
total certification fee, $601. The my shed, there are two physical inspections. The first one must be done when you've got the site leveled, the formwork, plastic and mesh in place. The certifier will need to check the depth of your holes and make sure you've prepared the slab properly. It gets a bit time critical here because you want to have the first inspection done shortly after the formwork's prepared, but as soon as the inspection's done, you want to have the concrete coming in. Ideally, you can do all this within a working week, and council are fairly responsive when it comes to booking your time. For my shed, council were happy just to do two inspections in total. One of the things they look for in the final inspection is how well you've dealt with stormwater to make sure you've got drainage in order. Once that's good, you get your certificate of occupancy, and it's all done. Now, I had some other earthworks and concreting work going on at the time, so I've estimated what this would have cost if it was only for the shed. The ground was pretty flat, so the 10 holes were easy to dig. For earthworks and the slab, a fair estimate would have been about $6,000 all up. I just want to say before I get into the build, I'm not a builder or a tradie, I'm just a DIY guy figuring stuff out and making a few mistakes. If you've got some useful suggestions, please add them to the comments below. But if you're a keyboard warrior and just want to have a whinge, go and do it somewhere else. I let the slab cure for a couple of weeks, which gave me time to read through the installation instructions a couple of times, which are available as a PDF on the Best Sheds website. The first thing I did was to get everything laid out and easily accessible because once you get going, you don't want to be wasting time looking for which box something's in. I separated the rafters and top hats, opened all the boxes and made sure I had a clean workspace. After you've marked out for posts, you assemble the rafters and I used the slab as a reference to ensure the rafters were the same angle on either side of the apex. I wanted to try and build the shed myself so I could work around other priorities as well as the weather. My wife ended up helping a bit when we stood the frame up and I will say that at that stage you really do need some help as things start getting pretty heavy. Assembling the frame is pretty straightforward and can be done pretty quickly. You have to be mindful that the instructions are generic. So for instance, if you're adding a window, the standard approach is to sit it on the sidewall girt. If that isn't exactly the height you want, you could bend the dimensions a little bit to save your time later. So for example, by adjusting the sidewall girt spacing up or down, it might suit your window height better. But generally speaking, it all works out pretty well. There were a couple of issues I found out with the kit that I'll mention later on. I had to deviate from the instructions when it was time to lift the wall frame sections. Since these side walls are a bit too heavy for two people, you really need one person per pole. There's quite a bit of weight. What I'm going to do is unattach the wall girts from the second half of the shed. Just put up two poles each side, brace across from each pole, opposite pole. That way the bracing can support itself. Get that all nice and secure and rigid, do the rafters, and then I can continue onwards, rest the rest of the shed.
Fortunately for me, I had the machinery shed roof to use as scaffolding. By starting at that end, I had a good platform to secure the first rafter. At 3.6 metres high, these buggers get really heavy, and I would strongly recommend getting hold of a scissor lift so you've got something powered to raise the rafters vertically. So far the shed kit's been pretty easy. Everything's been pre-punched nicely and everything's lined up well so far. It is a pity the knee braces weren't also pre-shaped as well. A little bit of mucking around with the, grind with the grinder on these, but can't get everything, I guess. Cutting them all out before you install them means you can copy one off the other. Just make sure you get the first one right. I ended up punching a few more tech screws into these later. So here we are, didn't film the whole thing because it was up on the roof most of the time. I was able to get up on the other shed roof and do the first one. So that's a nice and easy start. So you're supposed to overlap the air cell by 50 mil for the roof with tape or 150 mil without tape. But on the walls, you butt join it. Since I've got one continuous piece going over the whole lot, I had to make a decision whether to butt join the whole lot or overlap the whole lot. So I've done an experiment here for the walls with an overlap to see how much of a bump it creates. I think the impact's pretty minimal, so I'll just use a 50mm overlap for the air cell and sheet over that for the whole thing. I'm using some 72mm reinforced ducting tape to join all the air cell. I had to purchase this separately, about 30 bucks a roll. I needed two to three rolls in total. Also got some self-adhesive foam spacer biscuits, which help you maintain airflow between the insulation and the iron. It's important to maintain around 40mm gap since the air cell is designed to protect against radiant heat, not conductive heat. When the surfaces touch, you're allowing heat to transfer conductively through to the inside. I bought three bags of biscuits for $100, and this was plenty to do all the walls. For the roof, you just let the air cell sag about 40 mil between the purlins. I didn't measure this, it just kind of sags about the right amount without any real effort. I continued wall cladding all the way up to where the window and PA door opening started so I can install them where a wall sheet ended. This meant I had a nice factory edge of the wall sheet for one side where the opening started. The PA door and window go in pretty easily and again simply a case of following the instructions. Once I'd finished cladding I added the corner flashing, barge capping and ridge caps. Here I'm levelling for the roller door headers. There's a separate booklet for the roller door installation then another guide for the electric motor. I'm not going to cover the doors off in detail because it'll take a whole film in itself. There's plenty of stuff out there on YouTube, so I'd suggest having a look at those as well. The main thing is to understand all your clearances before you begin. 
and go through the instruction booklet so you know what's happening before you start. I really took my time to understand how to adjust the spring tension safely. Once I'd done this a few times, it was pretty easy using a 450mm pipe wrench. In the interest of time, I'll skip ahead. For plumbing, I started with the gutters. Once I'd cut, riveted and silicon the downpipe pops, I used a string line to mark where the gutter brackets needed to go, allowing 40 mils across the 10 metre lengths for fall. We're on rainwater here, so I'm harvesting all the water. Due to the layout of my sheds and the position of the water tank, I'm running two separate lines back to the tank and I've decided on a dry system so all water passes downhill. This side runs along the inside wall of the machinery shed and the other side around the outside. The plumbing joins on the other side and passes over a frame I built from angle line. Water in the sheds gathers in this tank where I can pump it into the main concrete tank as needed. All collection points have leaf and mosquito mesh and I've built first flush systems for each catchment. This catches all the initial contaminants like bird poo and prevents leaves and junk from blocking up the lines. I built the first flush systems with some 90mm pipe and ball valve taps from the local hardware. Every so often I can walk around and release the first runnings. I also ran some additional plumbing through the 250mm step which joins the two sheds. This is just to carry excess water if we have a serious storm and the gutters overflow. But I still need to concrete the strip between these two sheds on the outside. I'm using a sealer called Pave Coat by Nutec as it comes in a 20 litre drum and is fairly priced. My floor is going to get pretty beaten up over time so I didn't want to throw too much money at it. I also wanted to match the machinery shed floor, which is quite uneven. First step was to use a concrete cleaner on the old floor, then an etcher across the whole slab. I let this dry out for about four days before applying the first coat of Pave Coat Sealer. For the first coat, I thinned down with 20% thinners, so the product has a better shot of soaking into the concrete pores. The roller I used is designed to handle solvent-based liquids, as the cheap ones can start to fall apart. I've estimated a total cost here, but since I did the machinery shed also, I actually spent a bit more than this, and I've got another half tin of pave coat left over for touch-ups. In some spots there's a pretty big gap to the outside wall between the slab and the iron. I had some old quickset concrete, some made a wall with structural pine, and backfilled behind it. As well as stopping mice and bugs coming through, it gives me something to sit the wall cladding onto so it's off the ground. Here in Australia we have a product called Structor Floor, which is a flooring product that clips together with a yellow tongue. It's super strong, it's moisture resistant and it's got a nice flat surface. It's perfect for hanging tools and building shelving with. I'm going to use this to line the walls where I'm going to have shelves, but I'm not going to use it for everywhere because it's quite expensive. Plasterboard or gyprock is around half the price, so I'll use plasterboard for the sections where I don't need to hang things, like up high. But for the rest of it, this stuff is excellent. You just want to make sure all the weight is going into the floor because it's pretty heavy. For the inside of a shed, you've only got four walls to hang stuff. So what I'm doing here is building a pantry. Now that little room will allow me to store some things I want to keep dust free, like paints, keep them nice and dark and out of the light. It also gives me the chance to hang more tools. And I'm also going to include a little inset. So the workbench that runs along the front, my drop saw can sit on, and the depth of the drop saw can sit inside the, the inset. I'll go inside the cupboard, and then on the inside of the cupboard, I'll use that as a feature for shelving and putting stuff on. So everything sort of works together and it's killing a few birds with one stone. Here's a shot showing the workbench and I've started building some tool modules. Normally my YouTube channel is for making industrial style things like these and all these have their own build videos on the channel. While this shed building video is a little bit outside my usual genre, I do have a heap of neat workshop organisation ideas that I'll make videos of. So subscribe if you want to see some of those. So let's talk a little bit about electrical. While I'll have a crack at most things, I always leave electrical to a licensed professional. 
Most of it comes down to planning what you need now and what you think you'll need later. My electrician installed new RCDs on the board that comes into the garage. Each one is now itemised, so if something trips, I don't lose power to everything. Make sure you get an electrician to label the RCDs, as they often don't, and it's a real pain remembering what does what. I'm only on single phase here, but I do have a lot of 15 amp tools, so I've got a few 15 amp points at each end of the shed. I've also got one in this storage shed for my air compressor, so there's a little bit less noise in the workshop. The drop saw's got a switch that enables the power point behind to receive power. This powers the shop vac attached to the dust port, as well as powering the saw itself, so I can't forget to fire up the dust extraction whenever I need to use the saw. I've got a similar setup over here. This switch lets me turn on the overhead LED baton lights that will be suspended above my workbench. Speaking of lighting, I've got 10 double LED baton lights in total, four in the machinery shed and six in the new workshop. These have adjustable microwave sensors, which work a little bit like sonar. The sensors baseline distances to objects and trigger if those calculations change. They're a bit smarter than basic infrared lights, but you do have to tweak the settings. I've got mine so they come on when I'm within three meters of each light. So it's quite handy when walking into the workshop and not having to flick any switches. If the roller doors are open on a bright day, the lights won't come on at that end. Apart from that, I've got lots of power points and everything going through conduit since it's a metal shed. It's hard to put a cost on all this because there are so many variables, but I can say the six LED lights in the new workshop provide ample lighting for that section of the room. You could be paying an electrician anywhere between one and $3,000, but it really is hard to say and depends on your situation. To summarize, let's start with the overall costs. And remember, some of these figures are an estimate based on a 70 meter squared shed. I've just set $1,000 for the internal cladding, but this will grow as I continue to fit out the inside. Generally speaking, what I've got here comes in at around $20,000. I paid a bit more due to the machinery shed, but this figure's a fairly decent yardstick. Most of the shed building contractors quoted around $6,000, and this does not include any of the stormwater plumbing, floor ceiling, or internal cladding. On to some lessons I learned, don't dig the holes too early. Mine sat for over a month while I sorted out the paperwork, and by that time it rained a lot, so I needed another meter of concrete. Another one is getting hold of a scissor lift. While I could use a tractor, it required some mucking around and probably wasn't the safest option, to be honest. On that note, while you can build jigs and rigs to do a lot of stuff yourself, having some help would make the framing and sheeting a lot easier and faster. Running the air cell insulation right across wall, roof and wall burned up more time and couldn't be done if there was any wind around. If I was only insulating the roof, I'd probably have waited for help and left the walls as one single piece, as per the instructions. Some gripes on the best sheds kit. Generally the quality is great and I'm pretty happy. It was lacking quite a few roofing screws though, so not sure if mine was missing a bag. The biggest issue I have with the kit is the location of posts in relation to the roller door guide rails. If you follow the instructions as I did, the bottom plate bolts foul where the door curtain needs to come down. This could be avoided by shifting the bracket during the framing phase. In my opinion, this is something that should be revised. I had to figure out which instructions to look at for my roller doors and motors, as there are a range of models and variations to identify. It would be nice if they packaged all the required documentation together for my specific order. But I guess in most cases, professional shed builders are doing the work, so they already know what they're doing. I am happy with the final result. The wall above my workbench will soon be covered in more tools, and I'll move on to clamp racks and all the other stuff. Then I'll be able to roll in all my larger mobile tools and start making things that I enjoy. Thanks for making it to the end. There's a lot to cover in 25 minutes, so I hope you gained something useful. Please consider subscribing, and I hope to see you in the next one.